So hello there and welcome to a brand new episode of the DNF1 F1 podcast, the show where we talk all of the latest news, gossip and events in the world of Formula One and we relay that back to you for your listening or viewing pleasure, depending on which platform you choose to follow us on. And I want to start this episode with a very celebratory message and that's to thank every single one of you that has tuned in and subscribed to the DNF1 F1 podcast whether you are listening to us on YouTube or on your favorite podcasting platform and the reason why I'm in such a celebratory move is because we have finally made it to 500 subscribers on YouTube so thank you to everyone who has uh, as I said who has subscribed to the channel as you can see if you are watching on YouTube you will tell that Courtney is very very happy it, it does feel like it's been a long time to get to it's 500. It's been 84 years. Yeah, just like the Titanic meme, definitely, definitely. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we've all aged terribly waiting for this one. But uh, yeah, absolutely fantastic news for us. We really, really appreciate you guys that, uh, you know, take time out of your lives to tune into our little podcast where we talk about F1. And uh, we've had some great feedback since we've started this. Uh, two years, actually, Courtney, I think. Um, we're coming wow. up to our second anniversary. I'll have to check the date because we are very, very close. Must be. To when we started this two years ago back in my old flat in Greenwich so um uh, of and, dogs, uh, yeah how do you know of Isle of dogs, dogs. I, I do apologize yes no you are right you are right well it's it's, it's kind of it's, yeah well yeah no, fair it's enough. on the island yeah it, not, I won't yeah. be told otherwise for yeah, anyone that, for anyone who lives on the Isle of Dogs or in the East End will know exactly what we're talking about everybody else listening around the world has probably gone off by now because they're not interested <laughs> Uh, in the geographical part but anyway look it's fantastic news for us and we're really really grateful for your support guys and of course our next milestone will be the big 1000 of course the only way you can help us to get to that if you aren't already subscribing to the show is to hit that subscribe button and give us a nice little like as well i also want to send a big shout out a big thank you to tomo f1 now, for those of you who don't know Tomo, uh, Tom McCluskey, I should say, a huge F1 YouTuber, one of the biggest ones going, who very, very generously added us or sponsored us as his mystery F1 YouTuber for his latest video. So I'll also leave a link to his latest video as a little token of our appreciation. So if any of you haven't heard of him, go check out his channel. It's a fantastic channel, really, really big fans of it. And once again, Tomo, thank you so much for offering your support to us. And we'd love to have you on the show in the near future of course 100%. when your schedule permits it but all the uh, gratitude and celebrations aside let's get down to the main talking point of this episode now we've been away for a little while we took a little bit of a break for about a week or so and there hasn't been too much that's gone on in the f1 world of course we had the news about the sprint races and the changes at alpine and aston martin that we sort of dived into if you want to check that episode out you can do that was our most recent one i'll leave a card for that as well but now I want to talk a bit more in depth about the 2023 driver market. Now, 2022 hasn't even started for the F1 season and there's a lot of stuff going in the off season that gives us a bit of time to reflect on obviously the controversy that's happened in 2021, move away from that a little bit if we can and talk yes, a little bit about what is going on in 2022 and of course what we'll be talking about in 2023. Now, the driver lineup is a very... Very volatile thing, I must say. Most seasons, when you get to silly season, uh, usually in the summer break, you end up finding a lot of crazy stories and rumors going around in the paddock. Who is going to be going into what team for 2022 and 2023 in this case? And it kind of got us thinking that there's quite a lot of seats available for 2023. In theory, there are 11 seats that haven't been accounted for in 2023 yet. And, and while some of them might be tied down in theory by the driver that's currently occupying it, there is plenty of scope where this could change, uh, whether that be at Mercedes, owing to what Lewis Hamilton's future is going to look like, and of course, George Russell moving into that for 2022, how that's going to go. But then there are some other seats as well that you might not necessarily think too much about who's going to be in there. For example, Huss or Williams, where there's plenty of of options for those teams depending on how things go and of course the eventual domino effect where there could be one seat that could potentially lead to a domino effect depending on who leaves it and who occupies it and obviously going on then forth but look I've done enough to try and introduce this already uh, as you can see for those of you watching um, I'm joined by my co-hosts Courtney Pine and Lee Wallington for the benefit of those listening to this podcast on their favorite podcasting platform of course thank you so much for your support as well we haven't forgot you guys as well but we're showing a lot of love to our YouTube community on this specific day 
But I want to start this off by talking about uh, each team individually. I think that's the best way to kind of go through with this. So we're going to probably for the next hour or so, we're just going to run through all the teams and uh, let's talk about the current lineups and see what options are available for 2023, depending on what happens in 2022. And guys, I want to start with Mercedes. Now, normally you think Mercedes going into the 2022 season six months ago, we probably would have thought after George Russell was announced that that was it for their drive lineup for the next few years, at least until Lewis Hamilton's new contract was going to run out at the end of the 2023 season. However, there are quite a few potential circumstances that could occur, perhaps as you know, as recently as the next month or so, that could change things quite dramatically. Now, I don't necessarily want to entertain this as something that I believe is going to happen because I want to stress I do not think that this is going to happen. But for the benefit of this podcast, I think we probably should talk about the possibility of what would happen if Lewis Hamilton decides he's had enough and he doesn't want to stay in Formula One, particularly because of what happened at Abu Dhabi last season. Now, guys, I I know we've talked about this already. None of us really think that Lewis is going to call it a day and say he's had enough of F1 and leave and he, he doesn't want to come back. But if in the unlikely chance that he doesn't come back, it does leave quite a huge hole at Mercedes, one that they probably can't really fill at all with any of the available drivers to them in the short term. And I, I want to ask you guys your thoughts on this. Like, for example, Courtney, if Lewis Hamilton was to do the unthinkable and to hang up his crash helmet, and he's entitled to do so if he wants to, we should stress that under the circumstances. But if he does, What do you think Mercedes would do? Who do you think that they would look at potentially bringing in to replace Hamilton in in the short term? I think ideally they would want to look at one of the drivers they feel might be more available in F1, like Pierre Gasly, for example. But as we know, that wouldn't be, it'd be very, very unlikely for that to happen. So I think the closest thing you look at is some of the reserve drivers in the Mercedes, shall we say, academy or setup. I think the first name to spring to my mind would be like a Stoffel Van Dorn, somebody like that, or maybe a Nick De Vries from the uh, from the Formula E team, because they seem to be building quite a good partnership there. I think you know, there's, there's obviously you know opinions on a gap in quality between the Formula One and um, Formula E, but I think yeah, I think the the dynamic at the Mercedes team with Van Dorn and De Vries would give Mercedes a couple of options if they were put into panic mode. I, I'm like you, Adam. I think if Lewis was to leave, we would have known by now. And I think, obviously, with the title of the video being about 2023, I do believe that this will be Lewis's last season. And I think that's going to cause a massive domino effect. So I think it's really good that we are covering this topic because I think that the 2023 driver market is going to be a big one. Well, I mean, that that is a big point. I mean, it, it, it's also possible, I think, as you rightly mentioned, that Lewis could just come back for this one more season and then win the world championship, get his eighth world title and then be done with it. He may not want to bother with Formula One beyond that. Um, and, and there are some interesting options. We shouldn't forget um, Frederick Vesti as well in Formula Two, part of the Mercedes program, although at this point, I would say that's quite a huge jump to go from F2, even if it, if Lewis was to call it a day, um, to, uh, you know, today or tomorrow, and he didn't want to come into Formula 1 for 2022, you know, having someone like Vesti thrusted into the F1 seat, arguably the most lucrative seat in the sport right now, um, I don't see that being realistic. All due respects to Frederick, he may be a Mercedes driver in the future, but I just think that's one huge leap too far for him. Um, Lee, what would your thoughts on this be? In the unlikely event that Lewis decides to call it a day after what's happened at Abu Dhabi, who do you think are the leading contenders to jump into that Mercedes seat? And and more importantly, who would you like to see jump into that Mercedes seat? Well, I I would firstly just touch on um, what Corny said. Um, Corny is obviously the the main contender, I believe, would be Pierre Gasly. Pierre would love to obviously have that opportunity, but he's obviously under contract and Mercedes would have to deal with buying out the rest of that contract. But Pierre would have no problems being on a one-year rolling contract until Max Verstappen becomes available just so Pierre can have that opportunity. He would not turn down a Mercedes drive if he could get that uh, opportunity. Um, And on the stuff of Van Dorn uh, aspects, I believe he's the reserve driver for Mercedes and McLaren. 
So he's probably more likely than De Vries. Although I think um, Toto Wolf tried to get De Vries in the sport this year, but failed. So there, there that is the good uh, emergency backups that Corny obviously did to touch on. But I do want to make clear, I, I don't think Valtteri would want to go back to Mercedes. Although, obviously, have the nice, um, hopefully, because we don't know, a race-winning car title contender. He's been wanting to have the security of a long-term contract, and which is one of the reasons where he is now, um, at, uh, at obviously, at Alfa Romeo. But... He don't want to go back for one year rolling contract. He's been there, well done that. Um, and so he, I just don't think he'll be interested in that. So my personal preference would be Pierre if that came along. Um, but yeah, that's as we as you both said. I don't think that will happen. That Lewis will walk away. Well, I mean, it does beg the question, doesn't it, with Valtteri Bottas? Because, of course, you know, we should mention whilst he has that uh, medium term deal with Alfa Romeo that he's moved on from Mercedes after being let go in favour of George Russell it does raise a very interesting possibility that, you know, Mercedes could, if they needed to, potentially try and get Bottas back because he's a guy that's familiar with the setup at the team. He's been there since 2017 when he replaced Nico Rosberg. And Toto Wolff, you know, does manage his F1 contracts or looks after him in terms of that capacity. He helped get him into that seat at Alfa Romeo. He helped bring him into Formula One with Williams. He helped bring him into Mercedes um, from the Williams team to replace Nico Rosberg. So you almost feel that... In a way, whilst it seems very unlikely, Mercedes may be forced into a position where I think, well, for stability's sake, we may have to bring Valtteri in. And he might be the most realistic option. I mean, yeah, I can see the temptation of bringing in Stoffel Van Dorn, being the reserve driver. It makes a lot of sense. It's a guy that was highly praised going into Formula One. He didn't work out at McLaren, um, you know, for a lot of reasons, most of which I don't feel were his fault necessarily. Um, you know, and, and Mercedes, if they're going to have him as a reserve driver, you'd feel that he'd be capable of jumping into that seat at a moment's notice. And I'm pretty sure that with the links to the Mercedes team in Formula E, I don't think it'd be very difficult to do that kind of deal, um, even if it's just a one year contract until a more r- realistic option comes up. Another driver that I think might be interested in that seat would be Esteban Ocon. Um, and I think this would make a lot of sense as well. You know, this is a guy that had been on the Mercedes books for some time. I still think he has connections to the Mercedes team. Um, and, and, you know, again, another driver that Mercedes have wanted to bring in uh, before George Russell came along. It does seem to be a deal. And, and let's not forget, it does not leave Alpine in a position where they can't really put anyone in. Because, of course, they have Oscar Piastri. But sitting in their reserve yeah. position. A driver who should be on the 2022 grid should definitely be on the 2023 grid, and I really hope that he is. I mean, if he's not, something is wrong with F1 even more than it already is. Um, but if, if... I mean, is there a driver that either of you could think of that you would like to see on there? And I'm thinking, um, you know, some really crazy names. I mean, what about Fernando Alonso or Sebastian Vettel? Would Mercedes really yeah. entertain those options, and would they work for the Mercedes? Sebastian Vettel? Possibly, yeah, Vettel possibly. That, yeah, because Aston Martin, obviously, uh, you know, we we saw the whole tracing point thing a couple of seasons ago. There are links between the two teams, and also the German aspect does come into it a little bit as well. And I think it'd be nice to see Sab have uh, one last go in his championship winning car, uh, or possibly his championship winning car. Um, but I, I think like. If, it, if you're looking forward to like 2023 in particular, if look if or when Lewis does go, they are going to be looking at the likes of Verstappen, Charles Leclerc, because I've, I think it'll be interesting to see how the dynamic at Ferrari goes. Just I'm not going to go too deep into it because now we're going to go over the teams later. But hypothetically speaking, it could be a situation where Leclerc might be willing to go to Mercedes, for example. So I think they're going to go for one of the top top drivers. Obviously, they're they're losing. They're, they're going to lose one of the best drivers of all time. So they're going to have they're going to want to fill the void with one of the drivers who they expect to dominate the upcoming um, upcoming era. Well, I suppose the big question Mercedes would have if Vettel was on that list of candidates is, is the current Sebastian Vettel good enough to jump in the Mercedes? I mean, obviously, it's it's fairly similar to the Aston Martin, all jokes aside, although we are having brand new cars for this season. So the hallmarks between the 2022 Mercedes and 2022 Aston Martin probably aren't going to be as similar as we, as we joke yeah. them to be. Um 
you know, that's, that is a question I think Mercedes would probably ask themselves in that scenario. Is Vettel capable of doing the job we need? Um, this is why I entertain the Alonso idea, because for a one-year deal, I just think that would be a amazingly fascinating prospect of Fernando Alonso jumping into that car, especially considering that, you know, Alonso, Alpine, Alpine may have reservations about well, it's not so much Alpine. Alonso may have reservations about Alpine long-term and whether he wants to commit to them beyond uh, this season. So an opportunity to jump into the Mercedes would be uh, a priceless one. I mean, Lee, what do you reckon? Would you love to see Alonso in a Mercedes next season if to replace Lewis, if Lewis was to go? Firstly, El Plan Nuevo. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I'm sure uh, Fernando would love that opportunity to get into that Mercedes. Um, I personally would love Fernando to be in a championship quiet again. He's a driver of the calibre to be up there. Obviously, we're presuming Mercedes is going to be in a position to fight for the championship. So, we obviously, don't get get ahead of ourselves because we could all be proven wrong come testing and Mercedes is a dud. Um, and no one wants to go there. But it's. Uh, I hope that's not the case because, obviously, uh, uh, they, they were obviously one Lewis to be fighting for the championship again. For my personal preference. I mean, it'd be next level um, sandbagging, wouldn't it? Yeah, <laughs> you know, that would be um, something special. If our assumptions would be correct, then yeah, Fernando Ooh. being in that car, unless Alpine, as we don't know, Alpine could have a, a muscle car, and that's not El Plan or whatever. It's the El Plan because that's the best going to be the best car. It's so many things we don't know, and um, like taking into obviously consideration here. But yeah, Fernando being up there, that'd be that's I would love that to be up there fighting Max. Um. We'll obviously, yeah, every um, fan has their favourite, but if you want to put in skill and calibre, not in speed, just in skill and calibre, Fernando would be up there on anyone's list. So seeing him up against the new champion, just another battle of the generations that we obviously uh, haven't had as of yet. Yeah, I mean, if we thought Verstappen and Hamilton was feisty, imagining Verstappen versus Alonso, I mean... I, I think you'd sell that as box office. Literally, pay-per-view would be the, an understatement of watching the fireworks in that battle. Um, I, I want to entertain this idea as well. Let's say Hamilton, you know, hopefully Hamilton stays in Formula One, at least for this season coming. Um, there's always the risk that, you know, there's always a risk that Lewis Hamilton could absolutely destroy George Russell this season. I mean, let's not forget George Russell had one out for Mercedes, um, at one outing, I should say, and did an incredible job. Should have won the Sakir Grand Prix when he drove for them and showed everybody why... Every, why Mercedes thinks so highly of him, why a lot of F1 fans think so highly of George Russell, you know, not just off his junior career. And he obviously had a pretty, pretty good 2022, got his first podium, albeit in the race that never really was, but then ended up being a race anyway. But I'm not going to take that podium off of George Russell. I don't think anyone else would either. Um, so there is a lot of hope for George Russell in the in the hope that, you know, he can learn from Lewis and perhaps cause him some problems in the way that Lewis caused Fernando Alonso problems when he joined McLaren in Formula One. Um, and I think that's what a lot of people are hoping for to some degree. But there is also the possibility that George may, in a new environment, a lot of pressure, new expectations, may struggle to adapt straight away and may find himself in a position where Lewis comes in and absolutely destroys him. If that happens, do you think that might leave some doubt in Mercedes' mind about George Russell as a long-term heir to Lewis Hamilton's throne at Mercedes and perhaps may have to look elsewhere um, for that driver especially if someone else has an incredible 2022 I'm thinking someone perhaps like Lando Norris or we mentioned Pierre Gasly or perhaps if Charles Leclerc or Max Verstappen suddenly become available you know what are, what are those options for Mercedes I uh, personally I think they would give George Russell some time we saw that they did the same thing with uh, Valtteri Bottas you know they gave Valtteri you know, three, four extra seasons. Like if they went down that road of judging a driver after one season, like Val Valtteri possibly could have been gone as soon as 2018 because as good a job as he did for um, Mercedes as a team, he was obviously outperformed by Lewis. So I think that would give George Russell the benefit of the doubt. Um, I'm hoping that George Russell can do a great job for Mercedes. I think he will as well because I just, I, I feel that as Bottas, Bottas had his moments, but I don't think he was there enough for Mercedes in those big moments, particularly when we come to defending against Max Verstappen. So I'm just hoping that George Russell could do the job. 
And I think he will give Lewis a run for his money, actually, particularly in qualifying. I've said this in a previous episode. The big question mark is over his race pace. Was it possibly down to the characteristics of the Williams? We're not really going to know until we see the, the first few races because George Russell's qualifying pace was on a different level. Amazing. But the race pace at times um, was fairly average. So I'm really hoping that it was down to the characteristics of the Williams rather than George Russell's fault. Yeah, I mean, Mercedes always had the luxury of having a solid driver in Lewis Hamilton. Of course, when Nico Rosberg hit us with that bombshell and that he retired from the sport after winning the World Championship, Mercedes, yes, it was a problem for them, but in a way, it wasn't that big of a deal because they always had Lewis. So they were able to think, okay, who do we need to put alongside Lewis? Who's a solid driver that we can get in that car to partner Lewis Hamilton? And of course, it ended up producing one of the most harmonious uh, periods in Mercedes history uh, to date. And now, of course, with George Russell, that's they haven't really got that luxury because if Lewis is suddenly not available, if Lewis proves too good for George and then goes, all of a sudden, there are going to be doubts. Um, Lee, what are your thoughts on this? Do you feel that, um, you know, what, what do you think, Mercedes would feel if uh, George Russell found himself in that position where he was handsomely beaten by Hamilton? Do you think they would panic or do you think that they'd bring someone solid in and then just give George a little bit of time to sort of get things right and then produce what we know he can? Yeah, firstly, I don't think Mercedes will panic. I agree with Courtney. They are, I think they'll give him a couple of seasons. Um, it, firstly, um, George isn't coming into a completely new team. He has a very close relationship with the team. He knows the engineers, he, know, he knows the PR, he knows everyone he needs to speak to to get things done or ask for things. So he's not going to be a stranger. Like if you switch teams, uh, normally you don't know anyone because it's a completely new environment. It's not a new environment for George. Right, it'd be a new car, but it's a new car for everybody. So he doesn't have that as a negative against him. And the only thing that he will be lacking against Lewis's experience um, so at the beginning, in, the, in adapting to a new car, obviously we don't know how George adapts to a new car. We know from previous it, um, rule changes, Lewis is pretty good at adapting to new cars and altering his driving style accordingly. So there may be a few races on more for George to adapt. But as I said, we don't know his adaption skills and how he can drive his uh, change his driving um, style. Um, but. Mercedes have proven themselves they are more patient than, say, the Red Bull program, ring through their drivers. Um, I know it's a different time, but if you look back to pre-Mercedes championship era, Michael Schumacher had a, a, a run of incidents and crashes, silly little crashes. Um, but they didn't. They gave him time and they're like, oh, Michael's getting better, they're growing, and they had their faith in Michael will find his form. Obviously, he walked away at the end of 2012. But they never gone, no, stop crashing, Michael, you're fired. And they yeah. stuck with it. Um, and obviously, Michael has the name of Michael Schumacher. So there is obviously one thing in, he had in his favour. But no, I don't think they will give George the boot um, if he has a bad season. I don't think he will have a bad season either, I should add. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like a long term project anyway. But it's always, you know, interesting to think of, you know, how confident Mercedes will feel about that long-term future if Lewis goes and destroys George even more so than he probably did with Valtteri, of all due respect. Um, but let's move on to Red Bull. Now, Red Bull, again, this is a team that, in theory, it shouldn't have too many issues with their driver lineup potentially for 2023. However, there are a few little caveats we have to chuck in there. First of all, we've got Max Verstappen, the world champion, who right now has a contract running, I believe, until the end of the season or 2023, something like that. Um, and, you know, at this point in time, you would think that a long-term deal looks to be in the offing after that success. Uh, Max has often said he doesn't want to end this partnership. He wants to stay with them for at least another 10 years, maybe longer than that if he can. Um, you know, and, and there's no reason for Red Bull to think why they would want to get rid of him. I mean, Red Bull have been talking for years about trying to provide Max with a car capable of fighting for a championship as a tool to keep him within the team because they couldn't afford to lose him as an asset. I still think that that same issue exists for them, even though they have provided him a car that's won the world championship. Um, and I suppose the question will be is when will these talks take place and when will it be announced? Probably at some point this season. But in your minds, guys, do you feel that 
perhaps the better strategy for Max Verstappen would be to see how 2022 plays out, at least for the first six months, and then review whether the car he's currently in is going to be good enough to allow him to win more world championships, or if you feel that perhaps there's a better option elsewhere. I think the situation with the engines is very intriguing. As you know, we've got a, a, an engine freeze coming up, and it's going to be so, so important for each of the manufacturers to get the engine right. And I just, I do believe that compared to all of the other manufacturers, I do feel the Red Bull are at a disadvantage. Yes, it is still the Honda powertrain, but in a Red Bull name, but there will be some kind of instability there. And it wouldn't surprise me if it does affect their overall performance compared to all the other teams. I'm expecting Ferrari to take a big step forward. Um, Alpine are, are talking big about the changes they made to the engine. Mercedes, there's a lot of ominous talk coming from Mercedes as well. They they could end up in a situation where they have the potentially the worst power unit and they won't be able to fix it for another three, four years. If Lewis was to leave Mercedes next year, I have no doubts whatsoever that both Mercedes and Max Verstappen and his representatives will be in contact. And it'd be early in the season as well. Because the best drivers, if you have a, if you have a look through some of the best drivers, they will seek to go to the best teams and they have the people around them to help them do that. If you have a look at Fernando Alonso, for example, that's where Fernando Alonso goes against the trend. Because Fernando Alonso, for me, had the ability to be up there championships-wise with the likes of Lewis Hamilton and Michael Schumacher. But because of the, the, the fallouts and the decisions that he made about which teams to go to at the time, he was actually quite unlucky. He missed out on the opportunity to be with some of these teams and he ended up at a poor McLaren where if circumstances were different, he could have possibly stayed with Ferrari when they become stronger. He might have even ended up at Mercedes. But the decisions that Fernando Alonso made of certain choices in career led to him only ended up with the two world championships that he has. Yeah, very true. It's important for Max now that he has won a world championship and that um, you know, you know, the monkey is off the back, if you like. Um, you know, pardon the phrasing, but um, it does seem that it's very, it's going to be critically important for Max Verstappen's future in the sport that he does make the right call. You know, you can go from a situation where you're a Lewis Hamilton, you take the gamble, and it pays off massively. Um, I remember when he left McLaren, everyone was saying it was a backwards move. He was going to a midfield team. He was an idiot. Um, and almost right away, you could see the change in performance between Mercedes and McLaren to the point where it was an incredibly brilliant move and it become even better every year after that. And then, of course, you've got Fernando Alonso who went the other way. And, uh, it, it, you know, there were some peaks with Ferrari. You know, there was opportunities there. It just didn't really work out for him. But after that, it, you could argue that it just was a complete disaster. So, you know... There's always the possibility, I suppose, for Max Verstappen that if he does agree a new contract with Red Bull, that he could insert clauses, performance clauses in there that would allow him to get out of it and go elsewhere, like Sebastian Vettel did when he went to Ferrari, if things go wrong. Um, Lee, you're sort of nodding your head at that one. Do you think that's something that perhaps Max will probably look to include if he uh, stays on at Red Bull? Yeah, uh, well, I, I think he will have exit clauses. I think most um, top-end drivers have exit clauses because they're going to be stuck with a dud of a car. But I think another thing that will come into consideration for Max, like any driver there, apart from they have their own interest in the sport, they have their own self-serving interests of financials. Um, and Helmut Marco has um, apparently recently said that they Red Bull will not pay the silly money like Mercedes pays the silly money for Lewis Hamilton for uh, Max Verstappen. Obviously, there may be pre-contract talk, but if Mercedes have a better car and Mercedes come splashing the cash, or even Ferrari comes special in the cash. You don't know with Ferrari, but the bigger spending teams, because obviously the driver salaries are outside the budget cap. You I wouldn't be surprised that, oh, yeah, 30 million euros or whatever, 35 million, whatever Lewis is on, I don't know, because he's so many different numbers. But go, oh, Max, oh, yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, thank you very much. I'll uh, go for the higher salary. Why not? Um, it's a good car, and I'll make the most of it. Um, so that's going to be also a big consideration of Will Red Bull uh, be willing to pay the big money that some of the other teams maybe offer Max? That's uh, something else to keep in mind. Yeah, very much so. Um, I mean, we should probably focus the attention on to Sergio Perez, the driver that I think is definitely going to be most under pressure 
to retain his Red Bull seat beyond 2022. I mean, when we look at Perez's 2021 season, it was okay and good in parts, but it wasn't exactly great. You know, he was... He had a few moments. He won the Azerbaijan Grand Prix brilliantly. Easily his best performance of the season. He did well getting podiums uh, in France. And of course, you know, most recently, that performance he put in in Abu Dhabi where he was able to slow Lewis Hamilton to a cr- to a snail's pace to uh, allow his teammate an opportunity to get back in the championship fight, which of course, owing to other reasons, was successful. And... Um, For me, it kind of felt last season that whilst Perez wasn't bad, he almost got that contract extension by default, owing to the fact that there wasn't really any other outstanding candidates that could jump into that seat. I mean, Pierre Gasly would seem like normally the obvious option within the Red Bull remit, but we don't really know how firmly that door is shut on a return to Red Bull for Gasly. It does seem like there is scope for that to be reopened again for the future, um, especially given how well Gasly is performing. Alex Albon was on practically on the sidelines, so there was no feasible way to bring him back into the Red Bull seat, especially after the way in which he was removed from it because of the fact that they didn't feel it was good enough or consistent enough. Um and then, of course, there was nobody in the Red Bull Academy that was anywhere near with an opportunity of going into that car. And, of course, Yuki Tsunoda as well. I mean, there is a very interesting dynamic for 2022 here, guys, where Red Bull could potentially have three candidates for that seat next season that are, or none at all and in terms of, like, appealing options. Um And what I mean is like, you know, you could have Perez having a much better season this season, which I think he will do with more familiarity with a car and a car designed a little bit more to what he would want um, and a bit, you know, a bit more better structure to his own driving style to adapt to the car, etc, etc. Gasly could have another phenomenal season. Alex Albon could do really, really well for Williams. And I do think Red Bull do want Albon to be the outstanding candidate if Perez does not perform for them. So... It's going to be very, very interesting. I just don't feel that if Perez has another season like he did last season, that he will be at Red Bull um, beyond 2022. I mean, what do you guys think? Lee, do you think, what you, what chances would you give Perez for uh, staying at Red Bull next season? Uh, beyond this season coming, I should say. I think Sergio's um, like could have been at Red Bull for 2023. All depends on other drivers and not on his own uh, 2022 season. Um, I I agree with your sentiment that I think Alex Albon is Red Bull's preferred candidate of choice long term, especially of the tyre back in the Red Bull company as a whole. They would love to have a tyre driver in their car. And there's obviously the, that that connection is still running strong, which I think was one of the reasons why Alex wasn't given the boot halfway through the season like Pierre was. Um, so I think that's their preferred choice. Um, and obviously... I can't remember the actual length of Alex's contract, so I do apologise on that. But the if it comes along, Alex has a great season or a couple of seasons. They may go, oh, Sergio, we'll give you another extension for 23, and then we're going to give you the boot in 24 because Alex is going to be good enough for 24. Um, if Pierre has a storm, stonk of a season, as you said. Um, but it, if he gets outperformed by either of those, I, I think Sergio is bye-bye. Even if he has a great season, it's not in his hands at all. I think it's down to how Alex goes and uh, Pierre goes. And also how, how much that door shut for Pierre. Well, this is the interesting dynamic, isn't it? I mean, how how firmly shut is that door to, to Pierre Gasly? I mean, Courtney, we've often said on this podcast that we think Pierre Gasly should be given another crack at a top team, especially one like Red Bull, where there does seem to still be some life in there. But... Um, uh, do you share the sentiments with me and Lee on this one? Do you feel that Perez's future at Red Bull, regardless of how well he performs, can? I mean, we do believe, for, obviously, if a normal season for Stappen will beat him handsomely, but do you feel that it could depend on how well Alex Albon performs at Williams, or do you feel that Perez still has it in his hands if he does a much better job, as as we hope he does next season, that he could still be in that Red Bull seat? I completely agree with a pair of you. It does down to Albon. Um, I think Williams is one of the teams that anything could happen. And I think this, with the coming regulation changes, Williams could be one of those teams that could outperform what people expect. And that puts Alex Albon back in the limelight. Um, I think that, that there's two reasons why I, I think it will be Albon if this happens. First of all, I think that the lad does have the potential to perform at a top team. He was thrusted into the Red Bull 
into the into that red ball very quickly. He did a good job uh, at the time, um, Alpha um, Alpha Tauri. He did well with them, and I, I just I, I do believe that if he has that chance at Williams, I think he will be the best performer in the Williams. No no disrespect to Latifi, but I, I do believe that Alex Albon is the step up from Latifi, so I think he'll have that lead role, which will be good for him. I think he'll have that confidence. And if he does well, Red Bull will be looking for him. And with concerns to Pierre Gasly, I wonder if Pierre Gasly would actually want to go back to Red Bull. Now, I know on, on paper you go, OK, the Red Bull is always going to be there or thereabouts when it comes to challenging for the championships. But in my opinion, I don't think Red Bull treated him very well. I think his confidence was absolutely shattered. I've made it clear on this podcast many times my personal issue I have with how the drivers and actually how Red Bull in general is managed. I don't. I think it's actually one of the more toxic environments in the F1 paddock. Just from what I've become aware of, it might be completely different. We only see so much. But if I was Pierre Gasly, I don't think I'd want to go back in that environment. He's doing well at uh, um, Alpha Tauri. And he could get options like the Mercedes or maybe even Ferrari in the future. I just think he needs to hold on tight because, in my opinion, I think he'll have better chances to make a name for himself at better team, um, at other teams. Yeah, definitely. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about Pierre Gasly in depth over his options when we get to Alpha Tauri. Um, it's just kind of the nature of the Red Bull program right now. And, and again, mm. we'll probably get into that a little bit more later on. Um, let's move on to Ferrari. Now, of all of the teams on the grid, this is probably the one that I think we're pretty much dead cert of what this driver lineup's possibly going to be in 2023. I mean, we've got Charles Leclerc on a very long-term deal, the longest deal in the history that Ferrari have ever offered any driver, even more than Michael Schumacher. Um, and then you've got Carlos Sainz, who, on the back of an incredible 2021 season, um, despite having that one year left on his contract, it's widely reported and widely expected that Ferrari, if they haven't already begun negotiations on a new contract, will definitely do so this season for the medium term. Um, I mean, we had Matty Binotto saying about Carlos Sainz before Christmas that he expected talks to commence with Sainz over a new deal for the medium term. And for me, it's a no. It's probably the biggest no-brainer out there. Ferrari need to tie Sainz down to a new deal. Um and it was such a great season he had last season. Yes, ultimately, he did beat his teammate in the championship, although, you you know, there are a few caveats you could throw in, but the consistency from Sainz was impressive. Uh, only Verstappen really probably boasted more consistent numbers than Sainz in that regard. And even then, um, it wasn't by much, you know, owing to car performance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, you know, th that's kind of the dynamic Ferrari find themselves into. I, I guess you could say that Ferrari are in a very, very good position with these two drivers because, of course, they've got the driver in Leclerc who a lot of people have argued that is definitely in that upper echelon class with the likes of the Verstappens and Hamiltons. May not necessarily be on their level right now, but he can certainly live with them in equal machinery. And, of course, hopefully we'll see that this season in particular. But then you've got Carlos Sainz who whilst I've already mentioned his consistency, may not necessarily have the ultimate one-lap performance of Charles Leclerc. He might be a tenth off of that. Um, I mean, how close do you think Sainz could get to Charles Leclerc in terms of that ultimate pace? Do you feel that, you know, he could turn out to be the perfect wingman for Leclerc, or do you feel that perhaps there's more for Carlos Sainz at Ferrari than that? I personally feel that if Ferrari put together a strong package this season I think we could see fireworks between the two drivers um, Sainz has always had an air of confidence about him compared to actually a good number of the drivers on the grid and I think in recent seasons he's proven why I think he's finally getting the respect he deserves as a driver um, but yeah I just, I just feel that if they put together a good package I think the dynamic there will be intriguing to say the least um but I, I do feel out the two if anybody was to leave it'd actually be Leclerc so I think I think Leclerc would be I just feel he's going to be under a lot of pressure I think Sainz is actually built in the way that when he came in in the way that Leclerc came into Ferrari and sort of knocked Vettel off his perch I do believe deep down that there is still that gap in quality that you've mentioned, Adam, just in those big moments, Leclerc does have that. But again, you know, we're talking about a lot of hypothetical situations in this in this podcast. Science is capable of unsettling 
Charles de Clare and becoming the main man of Ferrari. I, I think I don't I don't think it's like very likely to happen, but it is possible. So I think you're right. I think Ferrari are one of the most stable driver lineups. But <laughs> as we've seen a lot in the past, a lot can change in Formula One in a very short space of time. No, no, I mean, that's very true. I mean, the reason why I'm quite calming over this uh, as a Ferrari fan is that the dynamic of Ferrari has really changed. The atmosphere has really changed. And I think Carlos Sainz has played a, a big part of that. I don't see this as a partnership that is going to blow up in, is going to go up in flames or produce fireworks between the two of them. I mean, it could, but I think thinking of the long term, I think, you know, despite Charles not winning the battle between the two of them in the championship. As I said, there are a lot of reasons for that that weren't necessarily in Charles' control. That being said, um, as uh, Courtney's having a play with his camera there. All good. Um, All that, good. <laughs> we'll carry on. Uh, but that being said, um, I think signs proved to be even more of an asset to Ferrari than I think Ferrari anticipated. And this is why it makes perfect sense for them to tie him down to a longer term deal. I mean, for Carlos Sainz as well, you know, he's been at a few teams now. He's been at Toro Rosso. He's been, obviously he was born the Red Bull program, but he never really made it into the senior team. Then he's been to Renault. Then he went to McLaren. When he went to Ferrari, all with the aim of trying to set up new, and lay some foundations at each one of those teams. And it hasn't worked out for one way or another. Of course, McLaren. You know, it wasn't necessarily an issue. It's just Ferrari come calling. You don't say no. Um, and I kind of get the impression that he wants to do the same thing at Ferrari. I think he wants to lay down some foundations here at Maranello. The team love him. He loves being there. The fans love him. Um, and he's proving to be quite an asset. It's a great mix of experience and youth as well. I mean, we talk about drivers that um, offer a lot of experience. And Carlos Sainz does offer that despite being such a young driver. I think only 25. I think only Max Verstappen, you could argue, offers more of that quality in terms of a mixture of youth and experience um, in Formula 1 than Carlos Sainz. So it's definitely a good club to be a part of. So I don't see any reason why Carlos Sainz would look to move elsewhere. I think firmly his priority will be to tie down a more longer-term deal at Ferrari and try and lay down some foundations there in the same way that his teammate has. Um, Lee, what do you think? Is there any chance that... Carlos Sainz could potentially look elsewhere if a better opportunity comes available. Maybe say Red Bull, if uh, none of their three options that we talked about earlier are destined to be in that car next uh, beyond 2022. No, I, I completely agree with um, what Courtney said that I don't think Carlos is going to go anywhere. If anyone goes anywhere, it'd be Charles. Um, Carlos, for me, maybe not as fast and outright pace as um, Leclerc, um, but if the, at the end of this season or when it actually starts, I wouldn't be surprised that Carlos is still out on top on points. It, consistency is key to win a championship. Right, we probably may not be in the championship fight, but consistency is still key to scoring the most points. That's how you win a championship. And Carlos is damn consistent. He might not have the flair and the, the the amazing one race here or there that Charles does. But I wouldn't be surprised that Carlos is still on top on points come the end of the this season, 22. And he had no interest in going anywhere else. He wants a championship. All drivers obviously want a championship. But Carlos knows Ferrari's going to be the best opportunity to get that. Um, he, so I don't see him going anywhere. So it's just me repping Charles Leclerc then. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Not a fanboy, I'm just passionate. Um, hey! Hey, got that one in there. But... um. Speaking of uh, one of Carlos Sainz's former employers, McLaren, I think we should move on to them now. Um, they've got Lando Norris tied down to a long-term deal that he signed last season at the Monaco Grand Prix. And of course, we've got Daniel Ricciardo, who has a deal up to 2023. Now, Ricciardo is a very interesting dynamic because when he signed for McLaren, it made absolute sense going from Renault to McLaren. Uh, of course, he was linked to Ferrari as well, but Ferrari opted for Sainz. And... Um, I don't think many of us anticipated Ricardo to struggle in 2021 as much as he did. I mean, yes, he did get McLaren's first win since 2012, um, albeit it was a 1-2 finish that we never really got to see him fight Norris over because Norris played the team game on that day. Um, but even then, the second half of his season, despite that result, was not necessarily impressive. It certainly wasn't an imp much of an improvement on the first half. So it does raise a question on two fronts. One, if Ricardo has an equally difficult season this season with the new car and a McLaren, you have two scenarios. You have one, you know, you have to ask yourself, firstly, 
does Ricardo still have the desire and the dedication to really turn it around and try and make this McLaren partnership work? Or do McLaren start to lose faith in him and feel that perhaps they have to look elsewhere if he's handsomely beaten by Lando Norris again or he's not getting the best out of the car? Do they start looking at other options and thinking, is there a driver out there that can get more out of this car than Daniel Ricciardo if he's regularly three or four temps off the pace from Lando? I don't think it's a scenario that either of them want. But based on what we saw in 2021, there has to be a few question marks that McLaren may have over and, and certain reservations that may have over the Daniel Ricciardo that we're seeing right now as to whether or not he's still got it. Um, what do you guys think of this one? Courtney, do you feel that Ricciardo is under pressure to perform this season? And uh, will McLaren look elsewhere if he's not up to speed? Uh, I think with, with Danny Rick, um, I think there, is, there will be obviously be a degree of pressure from McLaren, but I think the person that'll be putting the most pressure on Danny Ricciardo will be Danny Rick himself. I have no doubts whatsoever that last season hurt him. It would have hurt him massively. So he would be coming into this season with the mindset of the brand new start. I really need to kick on. I've settled in now at McLaren. He's got a good dynamic with his teammate. So I think they're going to be... He, I, we, we know that you know, particularly with he's one of the best like late breakers on the grid, for example. He, he just has he has those moments that some drivers don't have. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't say he's the elite level driver. You know, I wouldn't say he's up there with the Verstappen's, Hamilton's. He's not of that caliber, but he's definitely capable. We've we've seen he, he's a master of winning chaotic races. If there's been like accidents, uh strategy mess mess ups with safety cars and stuff like that. Danny Ricciardo is always well, particularly his time at Red Bull, is always there to pick up the pieces in the current race. I just think he has that way about him. It's 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 a, it's a special talent that he has. So I think it's something that McLaren, I think is actually a team of McLaren's size or or where they expect to be on the grid. I think that's a very good asset to have in Danny Ricciardo. Yes, he wasn't as good as we know he can be, but we know that historically he has the capability to be there to get the big results for McLaren, which he showed last season with that win. The first opportunity he had to win, McLaren had to win a race, it was Danny Rick that was there to take it. So I think they will. We know we've discussed it with a couple of other drivers already. I think they'd be willing to give Daniel the chance. And there is the popularity thing, and I might sound silly, but Danny, Danny Rick is one of the most popular drivers on the F1 grid from a business perspective. He brings in a lot of money through merchandise, for example. So I think he will have more time at McLaren compared to maybe some other drivers would if they was in the same situation as him. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be a big season for McLaren because, you know, since the Honda partnership in 2015, they went on a downwards trajectory. It's been very, very difficult. And they've only got themselves back to a point where in the last two seasons, they've finished in at least the top four, you know, albeit third mm -hmm. place in 2020. So... You know, right now, they're in a very, very good position where they're ready to jump to make that next step. I know they've been held back in certain regards, but it seems like the shackles are now being freed from McLaren. They have more license to do certain things. The car, obviously, is going to be brand new. There's a lot of facets into this McLaren project that do require both their drivers to be on top four. Now, we don't have any reservations, at least not anymore, about Lando Norris. I mean... You know, maybe we're talking about this and it turns out Lando Norris is the best driver in Formula One and we're only just starting to see that now. We're just, you know, Daniel Ricciardo is unfortunately a victim of it. And, uh, you know, it, possibly, but, um, you know, the, there's other answers. Who knows? You never know. You never know. It might be you chuck Lando Norris into a Mercedes Lewis Hamilton 2.0 and, you know, that, that you know, maybe that's an argument to have for another day. But, um you end up being in this kind of position right now where Daniel himself, now I don't want to put any words in his mouth, but Daniel himself has admitted that he's not really spent too much time on the t dealing with the technical aspects of this new McLaren. He's been more of a driver that's focused on being in the right frame of mind, driving on the seat of your pants and really using all that feel and the way of driving that only he can, as you mentioned, Courtney, late braking and pulling off those amazing manoeuvres that we know and love him for, you know, really going for it. Um, but because of the complexity of these former cars, it's been very difficult for him to adapt in that regard in a way that someone like Lando Norris, who is very much technically minded in F1, has been able to benefit from uh, and the struggles that come from having a new car that will give you. So 
with these new cars being a little bit more simpler and hopefully at least from an aero perspective perhaps technology wise may be equally difficult could lee do you feel that this is something that daniel has to try and give a bit more consideration for or perhaps needs to find a perfect balance around this or perhaps something mclaren can help him with to have a better 2022 because it it does feel that last season mclaren were probably able to learn quite a lot from daniel in that regard and perhaps they need to mitigate those issues for him to get the best out of him for 2022 uh, which could of course impact his uh you know future of the team um, so, firstly, I do want to say I think this is a key season for Daniel. Um, yeah, um, so he's going to have a lot of pressure from himself and f- probably from the, the, the team as well to obviously help him grow. You're saying about the technically minded, uh, as proven with, we're going to go to Lewis quickly on this, as our drivers, you drive by your sheer talent. But he, he Lewis learned a hard session in 2016 of Technically minded can outwin pure talent because he was being by Nico, who was very technically minded. So Lewis took that on board and paid more attention to the technical aspects of the car and not just the seal of his pants talent. So maybe on that note, Daniel should go a bit more technical minded to understand more of the car and not just on his pure talent. Um, but I do want to add in a, an extra spanner into these 23 talks of Zach Brown has recently said if um, Pato Ward wants to drive in Formula 1, go and win the IndyCar Championship. Obviously, it's another what if, but what happens if uh, Ward wins the IndyCar Championship this year and Daniel has a uh, terrible season? Well, Zach, Zach Brown's been a man, a man to honour his word. He's done that with Ward giving the test. He, um, Daniel Ricciardo with his car um, driving uh, the stock car. So... That's another aspect of the 23 that potentially Daniel may be feeling, especially if uh, Award has a good IndyCar season or wins the championship, I mean. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very important to consider someone like Paso Award at McLaren for the future and, and Colton Herter as well, another driver um, that's impressing a lot of people. And of course, F1's been crying out for an American driver, someone like Colton Herter, you know. So um, there's certainly options for McLaren and I think they will be looking in that direction if Ricardo underperforms this season it's going to be a big year um I don't think it will happen I think Ricardo will improve this season but you know there are going to be a few question marks if he struggles to adapt this season in the way that he did last season um let's move on to Alpine um and again this is a this is one that oh it depends on so many different things isn't it like between the teams and the drivers I mean Fernando Alonso is obviously the big one He's uh, the two year contract that he signed last season is up at the end of the season. And there's always been that question mark for some time now is will he stay at Alpine? What level of performance did Alpine need to be able to provide him to stay? The big reason for him coming to F1 was with a view to how 2022 was going to go. Guys, I'm going to throw it out there. What chances, based on what we've seen from Alpine so far, what chances do you think, or what the chances do you think Alonso will stay beyond 2022? I think on a normal season, I would be dubious as to how long Fernando would stay with them. Um, but we we saw in two thousand and nine. I think this was that was the last one of well, apart from obviously two thousand and forty, two thousand and nine. We saw such big changes, and we saw a complete change. You know, we went from a situation from seeing Ferrari and McLaren dominating to Braun, Red Bull, and sometimes even Toyota particularly at the start of the season. So this is a massive opportunity for teams like Alpine to claim their stake in Formula 1. And that's exactly why Fernando Alonso has come back. If Alpine were to fail, of course, I, I think Fernando Alonso would uh, would hang up his boots, let's say, because it, that was that's, that was his last... This is his last chance to possibly have a go at a championship. I don't think Fernando Alonso is in Formula 1 just to make up the numbers. He's there because he wants to win more championships. So... In my opinion, I think if Alpine aren't challenging for race wins this season, I think Fernando Alonso loses patience because, again, I said earlier on about it being a big season for Red Bull with the engine. It's also a big one for Alpine because Renault have been behind throughout the turbo hybrid era. They got close a couple seasons back, but they've never been up there on the level of Mercedes in particular. Obviously, every team struggled, but I'd say that Renault have sort of been down the bottom, there or thereabouts, consistently throughout this last, last era. So they need to get it right. 
not only for the sake of their team moving forward, but to hang on to that sort of where they can attract drivers of Fernando Alonso's calibre. It's a big season for this team. And, and some of the some of the stuff that's been going on behind the scenes with Alan Pross, that only unsettles. We we discussed this before. That kind of unsettling at the top. As we know, in even doesn't matter where you work in a management team, if you get problems at the top, that sinks down throughout the workforce. So if they haven't sorted this out quickly, I have no doubt that's going to affect Alpine's performance this season. So interesting times, 100%. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, uh, Lee, do you share those sentiments with Courtney on Fernando Alonso? Do you think it practically depends on what happens with Alpine this season? Um, and if so, do you think Alonso will try and look elsewhere? I completely agree with what Courtney said. Fernando, several times throughout the last year, was El Plan, El Plan, El Plan. And I'm not saying that as a, a, a Mickey Tegu reference. It's literally, if he can see the results of the plan or see an outcome of the plan, he will stay around. If he's in a in championship fight, if he's gaining race wins, he will stay around. If he's, as Courtney said, he's not there to make numbers. If he's at the back of the grid, yeah, see, you, he's, he's not going to go around. Other, te- other teams may be interested in 23. But they're all, it's so many, as you've touched on the beginning of the episode, of the dominoes. Um, it's, if Fernando sees opportunity, as we said earlier, Mercedes, yeah, why not? El Plan hasn't worked here, El Plan oil. It, it, it will it'll adapt, but only for a championship um, fight. Um, if he doesn't have the opportunity, I, don't, I wouldn't be surprised if we, this is Fernando's last season. Yeah, it kind of sums it all up with Alf, um, Alpine at the moment. Um I mean, for me, and I agree a lot with what you guys have said, like Courtney in particular, um, talking about how they've been huge underachievers for some time. I would say probably 2017, they got to a certain level in the midfield and they haven't really progressed from that. I mean, 2020, yeah, they had a couple of podiums with Daniel Ricciardo. Fair enough. You know, we all saw the tattoo that Cyril Abitable had for that one. And, you know, that was the best part of it. Um, but they've, they've always seemed like the sort of team at Endstone that's, you know, despite the hard work that goes in all the great people that do so, so many amazing things, at the upper level, it's always come across as a team that's less than the sum of its parts. I mean, you look at the management structure, how often that's been changed in recent times. Courtney, you've mentioned Alain Prost has obviously left the team, not necessarily by his own accord, by the sounds of what his response. Lauren Rossi... Um, his involvement in and the changes that have been going on there. You know, Marcin Bukowski, Davide Brivio, you know, all the changes there. And then, of course, it will now be four different um, four different team principals in a number of years when eventually, if Otmar Zafner is the guy to come in, you know, you know, what does he do then? So, for me, it's always felt like Alpine have just been going through this merry-go-round with this management structure that's gone back to the Renault days and he's never really been able to find a structure that's been consistent, stuck with a task, stuck with a project and tried to make some sort of tangible progress. It's kind of just whatever they've achieved has kind of happened almost by fortune of just where they are at the time. They've never been able to build on that. I mean, we look at the car this year. I don't know the ins and outs of the car right now. I'm not going to pretend that I do, but I want to talk about um, the engine stuff as well, because the management structure is certainly not going to help with the car, you know, development. Um, and it's still tied down to the old regime, some of the stuff there. So that's still going to affect it, not necessarily in a good way. But the engine stuff, they didn't really do any work on the 2021 engine at all because they wanted to prioritize 2022. And what I'm hearing, I'm hearing rumors that they're already having issues with the reliability. They're behind schedule in that regard. And we're getting to the point where we're getting perilously close to the first two tests. Um, one of which coming up at the end of February. Now, if I, an independent podcaster on Formula One, right, can see this and see issues already, surely Fernando Alonso can see issues on the inside. And as you said, Lee, talking about L plan, L plan, this, that and everything else, to say that Alpine's on the verge of something special and Fernando's going to benefit from it in the way that he did with Renault in 2005 and six. I just don't think that's going to likely happen. I'd be very surprised if what I've just said in that little monologue, and that is exactly what's going on at Alpine, if if that is right and Fernando can see this, I'd be very surprised if he wasn't already looking at other options in other teams. And then, of course, you've got the Oscar Piastri situation. You know, you've got him in the reserves and Alpine are going to be desperate to not lose an asset like him. I mean, if I was a team like somewhere else at the back end of the grid and I wanted to get a driver in my car, he would be at the top of my list. 
if anything, I'd probably just have a, I wouldn't even have a list. I'd just have a name and just be Oscar Piastri. Get him in at all costs. So Alpine cannot afford to lose him. So in terms of their future, I just don't think Alonso's future with Alpine in particular, not necessarily F1, is dependent on him at all. I think he's proven last season that he's a known entity and maybe, maybe they may be able to provide him with a car that gets him regular podiums. If they can do that, that might be enough to tempt him. But I just feel that Fernando might be looking at other options elsewhere to see the viability of moving to a, a top team. I mean, if you're at one of the top teams right now, do you think there's a seat available for Fernando right now? I, I'm not sure. Maybe Mercedes, but again, it depends on what happens with Lewis. No, I think with the, with the big teams, I think, I feel that the the, the, the the main drivers that the big teams would be looking at would be movements between the likes of Verstappen, Leclerc, maybe even George Russell, maybe Lando Norris, for example, and then in coming years, the likes of Piastri. I think, as, as horrible as it sounds, it's just a true fact of life that Fernando Alonso's form is only going to dip with, because of his age. Mm. So uh, this this season could be a little bit like Chris Hammond. This season could be a case of last alone for him. It doesn't matter how good you've been throughout your career. Unfortunately, every driver has their time. So I think this season is going to be a big one for him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's move on to Alpha Tauri. Now, we talked a, li- a little bit about this earlier when we were talking about Red Bull. And again, this one, this situation kind of depends on the performance of their drivers this year. You know, both drivers have contracts for this season and not beyond that. Um, You know, and they're both in completely different scenarios here. You've got Yuki Tsunoda, who had a few peaks in 2021, but was so inconsistent. Um, His performance certainly improved a little bit towards the end of the season. But um, this is a driver that's going to be under a lot of pressure to perform and deliver. I certainly think he's got it in him. Um, I think from what I saw of him in F2 and certain points in F1 last season that he's certainly got what it takes to be a regular solid driver in F1. Um, But then, of course, you've also got the issue that there are other drivers vying for that seat. I mean, Alex Albon is effectively on loan or trial, if you like, at Williams for this year. And again, if Red Bull don't feel that Albon is ready to go back into the Red Bull, they may decide to put him in the Alpha Tauri to replace possibly Sonoda um, or Pierre Gasly. And then you've got the five F2 drivers in the Red Bull Academy, the drivers like Yuri Vips, Liam Lawson, uh, Jay Anderuvala, Dennis Hauger, the F3 champion, and Ayumi Iwasa, and, you know, bringing those drivers in. So it does seem to me that there's going to be a lot of pressure on Sonoda to sort of improve this season, um, and he's going to have to do it fast. Um, Lee, what do you think? Do you think that... Sonoda currently is hanging on a knife edge for his F1 future or do you feel that perhaps he might be in a situation where if one of the five drivers I mentioned below have a stonkingly brilliant season I mean I'm really looking forward to seeing Dennis Hauger in F2 this season if he has a season like Piastri did coming into Formula 2 and then winning it on his first go could we potentially see Sonoda out of a drive for next season? Yeah, I personally have the opinion that Sonoda is only in this season because the Red Bull um, Kevin me didn't have a driver ready to take his spot plus maybe a little bit of Honda's influence to the Japanese mm-hmm. driver but I was not impressed with Sonoda's performance last year um, I got a feeling that Red Bull weren't overly happy with it but they just didn't have a better option um, obviously there was Alex but he ended up at Williams um, so it's yeah he's a lot of pressure on it. he has to massively improve over last year um, if he doesn't, Red Bull are known to be harsh with their drivers. I'm surprised they weren't harsh last year, but they won't make, they won't do that again. They won't be so nice. So that this would be Yuki's last season if he does not improve. He needs to stop having the silly accidents, crashing the car, going off. He needs to be close in performance to Pierre. And uh, so you can only measure by the teammate. And he was vastly dominated by Pierre last year. And he just can't let that happen again this year. Yeah, very much so. Um, And as I said, they do rate him fairly highly there. Franz Soss does talk him up. But of course, we need to see improvements from Yuki. We need to see him consistently performing more. Because, you know, uh, Alpha Tauri at times had a car capable of racing and sometimes beating Ferrari and McLaren in that midfield battle. And then they ended up slower than, well, they ended up finishing lower than Alpine in the championship. Yeah. 
So, you know, that's a huge devastating blow to them. So they can't afford that again. And and in a way, that was in part due to the um, shortcomings of their drivers on some occasions. Um, I mean, we've got Pierre Gasly as well, uh, a driver that's certainly high in demand for a lot of teams, certainly a driver that I'm sure a lot of people will be keeping an eye on. And Pierre Gasly himself has... Whilst the Red Bull seat does seem possible, although unlikely at this point, it must be said, he's probably at the back of the queue behind Albon and Perez in that regard. But um, he's in a very interesting dynamic because Gasly himself said he wants to think about his long-term future. He wants to be involved at one of the big teams. He wants to be competing for poles and wins. And based on what he's shown, he he has won a Grand Prix and he's very, very good at qualifying. So he's certainly up there in that regard. Um, But he, he finds himself in an interesting dynamic where... The teams that he wants, you know, the only teams that really are good enough for him are the teams that he wants to go to at the front. But then, of course, the teams that are below him, he's not really interested in, despite the fact that they're the ones that would obviously want to take him on in a heartbeat right now. So it's a very difficult scenario for him, but an interesting one nonetheless. I mean, Courtney, if you're Pierre Gasly right now, you were talking about this earlier. Where are your thoughts on this? Do you hold out for a big team? And and if that doesn't come, do you take a role at a smaller team? For the time being, if Alpha Tauri don't decide to keep you on because of the Red Bull influence, oh, I think I think this year I think Pierre Gasly is going to be like a meerkat. He's going to have his head up, looking here, there, everywhere, looking for opportunities. Because I imagine that he wants a clean break from the Red Bull program altogether. You know, he's he's been there throughout his career, and as I said earlier on, I don't I don't think deep down he's very happy with his treatment. At Red Bull, he's obviously happy that Alpha Tauri gave him the chance, but he's still in that Red Bull family, and I think he would like to make a clean break. I think ideally for him, he would like to go to Alpine, given the, the French connection. But given the things that we've mentioned, and we know that it's a uh, pretty obvious that he doesn't have the best relationship with Esteban Ocon, that wouldn't be possible. I think the, again, another big hypothetical situation: if Alpine were to, whatever reason move on both Fernando Alonso and Esteban Ocon, I would see a partnership of uh, Oscar Piastri and Pierre Gasly at Alpine. I think that would be that'd be great marketing for Alpine, great for Gasly. So if that would be one of the options. The Mercedes will be an option if Lewis retires. I think they would definitely show an interest in Gasly. So I think there's going to be various opportunities. And I think also the, the performances, it all goes back to the big loopholes that teams could find. There there could be teams that suddenly become the big teams and these driver dynamics that we mentioned, they all change. So I feel that this this driver market is going to be one of the most dramatic that we've seen in a very long time. And Pierre Gasly is going to be in the forefront of it. I think he really is going to be like a meerkat. It's going to be, it's actually going to be quite funny when you think about his situation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I want to move on to Aston Martin now because I want to try and get through the rest of these teams. Um, so don't drag this on too long. Aston Martin's an interesting one um, because Lance Stroll is obviously going to be there for the long term. You know, it's his dad's team. There's absolutely no reason why Lance Stroll is going to be removed. He's a solid driver. His dad wants him to become a world champion. We'll see how that one goes, but let's put an asterisk on that one for the time being. Um Sebastian Vettel has got a contract up until the end of the season. Now, this is probably the driver. If I could think of one driver on the grid that I think is most likely to leave F1 um, at the end of 2022, it's probably Sebastian Vettel. That being said, I still think there is plenty of scope there to try and tempt him to stay. Um, What are you guys thinking? Do you feel that this could potentially be Sebastian Vettel's last season? Uh, Lee, what are your thoughts on this one? I think it all depends on the car. Um, right, the touching on the Fernando, he's not there to make up the numbers. Sebastian's there not to make up numbers. He's he at his time of leaving Ferrari, he obviously questioned about walking away from the sport, but he decided that he enjoys racing. But he made it clear he didn't want to be there just to make up the numbers, and that still applies that as much as he loves Formula One because Sebastian loves Formula One. I mean. The, the Formula One championship quiz that they did last year, I think is the only one that got every champion back to the formation of the sport. In order Which is mightily well. impressive. That's, in order, yeah. That's amazing, yeah. Anyone um, who hasn't so, seen that, I definitely recommend checking that out. I think it's uh, beyond the grid when they do that. It's yeah. absolutely incredible. Um, so that's a greatly impressive love for the sport that he has. 
but he he's a four-time world champion. He wants to win races. He probably wants to win another championship outside of Red Bull just to prove that he can do it. Um, but yeah, it all depends on that car that Aston Martin delivers. And obviously, we saw signs of Sebastian of old last year. So if obviously he drives great and we see more Sebastian Rolt, he may find, yeah, this is this is how I used to drive. This is not obviously Red Bull, but this is how I, I drove at Red Bull. And this is this is I'm back. Um so it all it all depends on the car for me. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot to this because it's not necessarily just the team as well. It's how Vettel feels about his own performance. Yeah. Because of course there's a lot of things for Sebastian Vettel that would tempt him to leave Formula One. Interest, not necessarily in motorsport, but interest in his life outside the sport. And he's a very quiet, reserved person outside the sport. You don't hear any a peep out on him uh, from him on the internet or anything like that. He doesn't have social media. Um, but there are a lot of things that do keep him interested outside the sport. And a lot of what he felt last season, you know, you've you've got that uh, situation where he may feel that his own performance is not good enough or he's not happy enough with his own performance where he might decide to give it up. Um, so it's a very strange situation. I think if Aston Martin provided him with a good enough car and he can perform with that, that's enough to definitely keep him in there. Um, but it's kind of like comparing Seb to Alonso, you know, all right, six, seven years apart, both world champions, obviously trying to win perhaps one more for, you know, like nostalgia purposes, if you like, or for their own um, personal reputation. But you've got, where you've got Alonso, who's come back to the sport after a sabbatical, he's with Alpine, he wants to try and win a world championship, whether it be there or somewhere else. And it's in his nature where he's desperate, he wants to win another world championship. But then you've got Sebastian Vettel, even though he's at the same point of his career, you could argue to a degree, despite the, the age difference between the two of them, his desire doesn't exactly burn as intensely as Alonso's in that regard. So you do have to question whether or not Sebastian Vettel would be happy just to call it a day. He probably would. Um, but as you said, Lee, I think it does depend on the car. In a nutshell, well, if you flip it, if you like, um, Aston Martin are obviously going to be looking at Seb Vettel as well. They're obviously going to be wondering, is Seb the right man to lead the team going forward? You know, Stroll's not the best, best benchmark for how great the car is. I mean, he's a solid driver, but they were looking to Vettel to be the benchmark for their own performance. And at times, it wasn't quite as good as it could have been. Yes, he got a podium in, in Baku. He should have got one in Hungary. Great performances on the day. But we didn't really see enough of them from Seb. So they might be looking elsewhere. And as I said... Fernando Alonso could potentially be a driver that Aston Martin might be interested, or particularly Lawrence Stroll might be interested in bringing in a bit of star quality. But it's also a team that could potentially attract almost any driver with their project going forward. So, um, Courtney, what, what do you think? Do you feel that Aston Martin might be looking at options beyond Sebastian Vettel for this season, or for next season, I should say? Do you know what? I just want to go off on a, a slight tangent, right? When we're just talking about Sebastian Vettel, something just dawned on me, which is actually quite plausible. At the end of this season, we could potentially lose Lewis Hamilton, Fernando Alonso and Sebastian Vettel at the same time. Oh, God. Like, that's, that's our generation, guys. That's our generation. And if all three of them go, I'm not going to lie. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to be like, legit sad. Well, just that age 20 years sad. now. That's, that's, that's the thing. Free, like, that, that, is, that was our generation, right? Like, them, them three race when when they had similar packages, no racing each other, amazing top draw racing. I like they would be missed. That would it'd be a real shame. But I've, I've, I I agree with you guys. I think if if it's very similar to Fernando Alonso, I think if Aston Martin don't have the package, I think we could. This could be Sebastian Vettel's last season. I think that being in a team where you're driving with uh, one of the main managers sons i imagine that would be tedious i think there's always going to be that paranoia that you're not going to be given the same treatment or the same opportunities that's that's just human nature for you so i think the both of those things combined i think you're right adam i think even compared to fernando alonso sebastian vettel's achieved a lot more you know so he's he's won four world championships i think i think if any any sane man could would go into formula one and be satisfied retirement with four championships so yeah, I think Sebastian Vettel's one of the drivers. Actually, along with, I failed to mention earlier on, I think that along with Yuki Snowda, I think Sebastian Vettel's probably one of the biggest question marks before this season even begins. Mm. But I think ultimately, yeah, with Seb, it, it does come down to that. I mean, Lee, um, on the subject of what Lawrence Stroll would want, do you think if Fernando Alonso was available, would that be a signing that Lawrence Stroll and 
would want to bring into the team Aston Martin? I mean, it's got the star quality appeal to it, doesn't it? Uh, he he does um, have that star quality. I think for, for Lawrence Stroll, it's all about proving that Aston Martin is one of the big boys now. We've got the money, we've got the drivers, we've got the talent for the, obviously the, the design and the, the other members of the team. You can't, we're not a midfield team. Um, don't overlook us. Um, but it's obviously then the question of what would Fernando want to go to Aston Martin? Um, he's, he's, He's not, he's not there to make up numbers as I touched on before. So he would only consider that if he can attend, he would tend to be see Aston Martin has it, depending on the season. Goes a race winning car, championship fighting car, podium finishing car. Doesn't want to be another midfield, not, no results, because yeah, that's not what, what he's after. So touching similar arities with Sebastian, neither of them want to be in a midfield car. No, it's very, very true. Um, we'll just have to wait and see on that one. But it does sound quite interesting as a prospect. And, and Aston Martin going forward is going to become more and more appealing, uh, assuming that the project goes according to plan, or at least in the time frame that they're predicting for it. Um, I'm going to do the last three teams all in one bit. We've got Alfa Romeo, uh-huh. Williams and Haas. Now, of the six drivers that are going to be occupying those seats for 2022, only Valtteri Bottas is the only one that has a contract beyond 2022. So it does raise quite a few questions. And I'll be honest with you guys, I'd be incredibly surprised if all the other five drivers remain on the grid mm-hmm. for next season, let alone at the teams that where they're at. And that's Guan Yu Zhou at Alfa Romeo. You've got Mick Schumacher, Nikita Mazepin at Haas, and you've also got Alex Albon and Nicholas Latifi at Williams. I want to start with Guan Yu Zhou. Guan Yu Zhou seems to be the driver that... Alfa Romeo may have only committed for one season for now, but I'm pretty sure he's going to be a driver that F1 are going to be desperately trying to keep in the sport because, of course, they've committed to having a Chinese Grand Prix. We're going to have one in 2023. We're going to have a second one potentially added to the calendar as well by, you know, judging what I've heard. So even if Alfa Romeo don't want to keep him on beyond next season, there's also a possibility he can move elsewhere. I'm thinking perhaps somewhere like Haas because... It's kind of that merry-go-round, isn't it? You know, you've got Haas in a situation where they've got Schumacher, which they'll obviously want to keep him, but not necessarily keep Mazepin. And if there's a driver like Joe that's available that's got financial backing, surely Haas are going to try and sign him. So what are your thoughts on this one, guys? Do you think Alfa Romeo keeps Joe on for another season? Or do you think that perhaps it's going to be a bit of a bidding war between them and Haas just to get that money more than anything else? I completely agree with you, to be honest, Adam. Uh, whether, Whether we like it or not, money talks particularly in formula one so you know with the with the chinese element with the with the marketing that would come with that obviously the population of china is incredible so you think the viewing that that's going to bring for formula one in general they would love to keep them on so you're right i think in, if, if, you, if we just to pull it on raw talent i think joe would have a lot of proof but with the backing that he has, that also gives him a lot more, a um, lot more sort of opportunities compared to a lot of the drivers on the grid. So, I think you're right. I think Joe is probably one of the more safe drivers out of the six that we've mentioned. Yeah, I mean Nikita Mazepin's a driver I do not expect to see on the 2023 mm-hmm. grid. I mean, purely and simply because unless his dad decides to invest even more money or bankroll him in Formula One or buy a team like Lawrence Stroll, I just can't see it happening. Well, one of the things I've uh, been hearing about is Mazepin Senior is looking at um, investing into the Haas team. So if that does happen, then that is a that's a Lawrence um, Stroll situation and Mazepin's on the grid. Well, this is it. I mean, but then at the same time, if Joe becomes available, Alfa Romeo, because let's not forget, Alfa Romeo have got Teo Poor in part of the Sauber Academy. They will obviously want to bring him in, but if they can do that without the financial investment that Joe would bring as well, and Joe's not performing to a satisfactory level, I mean, they've got a steady, solid drive in Valtteri Bottas already, so there's no worries there, then they may, you know, decide to move, you know, to let Joe go elsewhere. And it might be appealing for Haas to get you know, not nothing personal against Mazepin, but just to get him out and get another drive. Or, with, I mean, or maybe it's Schumacher gone and it's uh, Ron Joe and Mazepin. Oh, good. I mean, this is the interesting dynamic because I was going to mention the Tifi in this breadth as well with, um, you know, the financial backing, although I'm not, sh- I'm not sure how much the Latifi family would want to bankroll him if it was to go to Haas or something. Maybe they will. We'd have to wait and see. 
again, another solid driver. So it's another option for Haas if, if uh, Williams didn't want to keep Latifi on. But what on earth do you do with Mick Schumacher if you're mm-hmm. Ferrari? Because Ferrari have Leclerc. Obviously, they want to keep signs, and I, there's no reason why I expect signs to go elsewhere. So he's going to be there for the medium term for another few more years. Um, and Ferrari only have Haas and Alfa Romeo as their customer teams, and Alfa Romeo have options already. So there's no incentive to put Schumacher in there. I mean that that ship has sailed. So if Haas doesn't get any better, and it's not an appealing option for Mick m- moving on with his progression, you don't want him at the back of the grid. What on earth do you do with him? It, 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 doesn't seem like there's really any other seat available. The only hope for him oh, is that Haas improve to a point where they're solidly in the midfield, where Mick can continue his development, because Ferrari aren't going to want him at the back of the grid if they can help yeah. it. The only thing I would say is there's an unfortunate um, circumstance that could arise that Mick may find himself that he's not on the 23 grid, because Gene Haas has made it quite clear he wants to lower his expenses for running the team. And if Grand Joe does hypothetically goes there and takes a sponsorship to Hass and Mazepin buys into the team. That's it. Sorry, Mick. You've got no seat. I mean, that would be unbelievable. I, I mean, that would yeah, be... We know biggest... pay drivers talk. Yeah. That's Formula One yeah. I see well, pa- I, you know yeah. what? I see panic on your face there, Adam. It's actually I just, so I, just <laughs> I can't imagine a scenario. I re- like, realistically speaking, I, I know it's possible, but I just can't imagine a scenario where Mick Schumacher is the one that misses out. I mean, that would create all kinds of... Uh, tremors in the F1 world over paid drivers. Right and stuff. It's it's absolutely crazy. I mean, yeah. you know, we talked about the travesty of Oscar Piastri missing out on an F1 seat when he definitely deserves one. I mean, what a prospect he is. Really, yeah. really is. You know, he's up there with the prospect level of someone like a Leclerc for the future, for example. I really think he's that good. Um, and George Russell as well, we have to acknowledge because he achieved the same thing that George did, you know, back-to-back Formula uh, Junior titles in F3 and F2. Um but yeah, I just can't imagine a scenario where Mick Schumacher gets the boot at Haas because Haas take on two paid drivers. I totally get it's possible, but I mean, crazy story. that, And and it would be because he's got nowhere left to go. There's no other seats available to him. I mean, Ferrari would like to get him to move up somewhere else, but it's always going to be at the risk where he might be tempted to go to join another academy ultimately. It's just absolutely crazy. Um, I mean, Williams, we already mentioned Latifi. Um, you know, he's in that same boat with Joe and Mazepin. He's got the money to move around. It's just a case of if they want to back him. I mean, Williams like him. He's a solid driver. He does well there. He operates at a very good level. And I think we could all agree that if Alex Albon drives as well as we think he does and he's a bit more consistent, he probably will be the outright leader in that team in terms of performance. But Williams are kind of in a unique position. They kind of have more freedom than almost anybody else in terms of who they recruit into their team. You know, there's no... You know, there's no pressures from certain drivers in their academy. There's no situation where they they have to bring on someone else. Or, you know, they've kind of got everything that they need to. So if I was Jos Capito, as I said, that list earlier, Oscar Piastri has to be the guy. If he's available, Jos Capito has yeah. to try and bring him into Williams. I think it's a no-brainer. Probably the biggest no-brainer of them all. You know, Adam, I, I think with Williams... I think Williams will, and I'm sure they will be asking themselves, where do we, where do we, where do we see ourselves in Formula One, and where do we see ourselves progressing as a team? Because you're right, if they have any kind of ambition to get back to anywhere near where they were in the past, they will need to be looking at somebody who is potential championship winning potential in Oscar Piastri. You know, you need to if you if you're lower down the grid. Or in any sport, if you're a, a lower team and you want to start challenging the top, you need to take risks with young talents. And Oscar Piastri is a prime example of that. So you're right. If that was to become available, they'd be silly not to go for it. And I think I just I I look at the dynamic in general at Williams. I do have eye hopes for for Albon. So he could well be that guy to get those big those big points for them that they need in order to start competing but yeah, I do I just I just think Williams have a little bit of an identity crisis obviously with the fact that the Williams family have, have left the sport together it's just the name I think Williams need to develop their, their identity within Formula One if they want to have a meaningful future staying in the sport yeah very very true uh, I'm expecting a lot of movement at Williams this year I'd be very surprised if Albon is still there next season I think he's either going to be in a Red Bull or an Alpha Tauri in 2023, depending on how that goes. And again, with Latifi, he may move to Huss if money. 
um, that might provide an opportunity for Piastri, might provide an opportunity for Mick Schumacher if um, he doesn't find himself in a... De- you know, so many different things. I'd be very surprised. As I said, the one thing I could probably almost guarantee as a fan of, you know, of this sport with some relative knowledge of it is, is that there is absolutely no way in my mind that Alfa Romeo, Williams and Haas are going to have the same driver lineups going into 2023. You know, all the other teams, you know, there is some amount of likeliness that they could probably retain what they've got, but not those three. Absolutely not. No. Um, Lee, any final thoughts uh, before we sign off? Uh, not overly. I mean, Nicholas Latifi, personally, I don't rate him as a driver, but he, he's another paid driver example. What I touched on with um, was a situation where potentially that could arise with Haas. So it's money talks in Formula 1 always has done that's part of the fundamental problem that we have in the sport that won't change because obviously money's still vital for the sport yeah. Um, so yeah that, that's the last touching point really coming in with that sad dose of realism yes. before we start. yeah off. sorry sorry to disappoint <laughs> everyone Enter- left the the high, lad. that's it we've left the realms <laughs> of the fantasy land that the silly season offers up with transfer room it's kind of like football in that regard who we'd like to see where and now we're back to reality now with that little sad dose at the end of it. But hey, look, that, that's... <laughs> Sorry. That, that's Harry. That's, that's reality. That's, that's F- reality for you. That's F1 for you. Um, but yeah, guys, I think we can pretty much wrap that up. But do let us know in the comment section, you know, what you think about the relative teams that we've talked about, their situations going into next season for their driver market. Uh, who you think is going to be left without a seat in 2023? Who would you like to see join a certain team in 2023? Let us know in the comments below. Again, for those of you that have subscribed to the channel, thank you so much for helping us reach that milestone of, of 500 subscribers. If you have enjoyed this episode, make sure to leave a like and consider subscribing to the channel. We'd really, really appreciate it. Our next milestone is going to be that elusive 1,000 subscribers. We definitely want to get that one and create more content for you guys as well. But in the meantime... Thank you very much for tuning in to this episode of the DNF1F1 podcast. We've been DNF1. Stay safe and we'll see you in the next episode of the DNF1F1 podcast. Take care. See you soon. Goodbye. (laughs)